Hello everybody, welcome to week 9's lecture and this week we'll be looking at clustering. So tonight we'll be looking at an introduction to clustering, then we're going to look at two really important concepts in clustering and these are similarity and distance and they're really just two sides or different sides of the same coin. Then we're going to look at two types of two clustering algorithms, actually we'll sneak a few more in there but the first is hierarchical clustering, and the second is k-means clustering. So first off, what's clustering all about? Well, you remember from what we've been doing all this semester that um, we were looking at prediction. So, And you remember that prediction's all about trying to predict or forecast the value of a, an attribute based on the at values of other attributes. And you remember that that's called supervised learning. So classification is an example of supervised learning where, we're, where we have a supervisor so we know the answer and the answer is the target, the class value. We, talk, we haven't talked at all though about unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is all about just trying to find a natural structure of data and this is where clustering comes in. So we don't know class labels, there may be no class labels, and all we want to do is find the natural structure inherent in the data set. So in classification, the groups or the classes are predefined. There's a class value or a target attribute. In clustering, they're not predefined and they may not even be a class. And with clustering, we're just trying to group the data points based on their similarities between one another. And those groups are called clusters. A cluster can be seen to be a group of objects that are similar to one another inside the cluster, but they're dissimilar to one another in dissimilar to to objects in the other clusters. And ideally, we want clusters that are homogeneous and separable. Homogeneous just means that all of the instances or the data points within the cluster should be similar, relatively similar, and separable just means that clusters should be quite different to one another. Now clusters can be different things depending on what we on, on how we measure similarity. So let's look at an example of that. Here we've got a whole lot of living creatures uh, listed in alphabetical order. So we have a shark, a cat, we have dogs, frogs, goldfish, lizards, a red mullet, so it's a fishy, we've got seagulls, a sheep, a sparrow, and a viper, so a snake. And we have several attributes about each of these animals. First attribute A is how the, how the animal give, gives birth. And we know that that's either um, by li a live birth or by an egg. Uh, we have existence of lungs, so that's a binary. Yes, they do have lungs, although they don't have lungs. And then we have the environment that they live in. And of these animals here, some of them live in the water, some of them live on the land, and some of them are amphibious. So if we were just to look at how the animals give birth to their young, so attribute A, we could divide the animals into two clusters. So the sheep, the shark, the dog and the cat give live birth to their um, offspring. And the lizard, the seagull, the sparrow, all the rest of them are, are eggs. Have existence of lungs, we get quite different clusters. Here we've got on the left hand side the mullet, the shark and the goldfish. So they don't have lungs, they've got gills, and all the rest have lungs. And again, if we look at environment, then we've got three different environments. We've got the, the, the shark, the goldfish, and the mullet, which live in the water, the frog, which is amphibious, and then the other guys, which live on the land. And we can cluster by a couple of attributes at the same time. So if we cluster by one and two, so what one and two, how they give birth to the young and existence of lungs, then we get a different set of clusters. So you can see that the way that we measure the similarity between the data points, we can get quite different kinds of uh, clusters. If we visualize clusters, we can, we can see there's different kinds of clusterings we can get. So on the bottom right, you can see that we have a whole lot of little homogeneous round clusters. And these and I should have mentioned different clustering algorithms, algorithms and methods 
and similarity measures will give us different kinds of clusters. So on the bottom uh, right, we've got um, just a whole, um, small round clusters that don't interact with, that don't um, really overlap with one another. And when we look at k-means clustering a little bit later in the in today's lecture, that's the kind of clusters that we get with that. But we can get different kinds of clusters. So for example, on the top left, we've got two clusters that are concave, um, and you can see they sort of interact with it one another. And if we use a k-means clustering algorithm, um, the, the kind of clustering algorithm we, we run on the bottom right, you, you can't find those kinds of clusters very easily. So you need to use different kinds of methods to get them. On the top right, you can see that there's a cluster within another cluster. Again, that's a, that can sometimes be difficult for some clustering algorithms to determine. And at the bottom um, right left-hand side, we've got a we've got um, two clusters that are these homogeneous round kind of clusters, and then one cluster that's concave. We see clustering applications in a lot of different areas, and sometimes it's called different things in different domains. So in marketing, uh, we call clustering customer segmentation. Uh, there we're trying to group customers into distinct groups, um, often for target marketing. So sometimes that's called database segmentation. Mostly it's called customer segmentation. So if you hear the term customer segmentation, it just means clustering. Uh, in car insurance, we might want to identify customer groups that have a high average claim cost. Uh, text clustering, we might want to group documents together or web pages. Uh, image clustering, we might, want to, we might want to group images into different um, groupings. These are all just examples of clustering. So what is a good clustering? Well, generally, we want to, a good clustering is one that will produce clusters that have high intra-class similarity and low inter-class similarity. Intra-class similarity is the similarity of data points within the cl class or within the cluster. So that just means the data points inside the cluster have a high similarity with one another. And low interclass similarity just means that the, the, the data points within a cluster are quite different to the data points in a different cluster. So the quality of the result that we get from a clustering algorithm depends on a couple of things. First off, it depends on the similarity measure that's used by the method. So with different kinds of ways of measuring similarity, we get different kinds of well, qualities of clustering. And the and the quality and the algorithm that we use, so or the implementation of the algorithm that we use. Ideally, we want clustering out clustering methods to, in some way, discover hidden patterns in the data. So you can see on the right hand side, our original data is just those black points. When we cluster it, we've essentially labeled each of those groups with um, a color or a or a a value. In in some ways, we're finding a potential target attribute or class or in clustering it's called a cluster. We can divide our clustering algorithms into two kinds as hard clustering and soft clustering. Hard clustering, or it's often called crisp clustering, puts every data point in only one cluster. So the clusters uh, therefore don't overlap with one another. We can also have soft clustering or fuzzy clustering and there we're allowed to have a data point in more than one cluster at the same time. So the clusters overlap. So we're only going to look at hard or crisp clustering tonight, but um, if, you, if you're interested in fuzzy clustering, then have a look at some of the fuzzy methods. So um, there's a method called fuzzy k-means clustering that, that's, a, um, that's a soft clustering method. Another type of um, clustering is called bi-clustering. Uh, it's also called co-clustering. So we've talked about doing clustering just over data points. So the rows of the of the data, but we can also do so by clustering does clustering over both the rows and the columns at the same time, and um, it finds by clusters which are subsets of rows which have the similar behaviour over columns. You often see this in biomedical um, methods. So you'll often see a a by clustering to produce uh, something called a heat map with um, gene expression microarray data. 
So we have several requirements of our clustering algorithm. First off, we want it to scale. So we ideally we want a, a method so that if we double the number of points, it, uh, it takes twice as long to run, not the square of the time to run, or twice the memory rather than the square of the memory. Ideally, we want it to be able to work with different types of attributes, so it can deal with nominal and uh, numeric attributes. We'd like it to discover, cluster, discover clusters with uh, arbitrary shapes, so we saw those concave clusters before. We don't always need to do that, but sometimes we do. This is often important in image processing um, problems. So in image processing, often you want to cluster pixels so that you find lines because lines will tell you where tables are or where walls are or where the floor is. Uh, we probably want our clustering algorithm to have minimal requirements on domain knowledge um, to set the input path parameters of the algorithm but it's good to use it if domain knowledge if it's available. We'd like it to be able to deal with noise and not be misled by outliers. We'll see um, in, a, in a little while that k-means clustering can't deal with noise and outliers very well. Ideally we'd like it to be insensitive to the order that we give the input records into the algorithm and again not all our, not all clustering algorithms are insensitive to that order, to that um, um, input order. We'd like it to deal with high dimensional data and again not all algorithms or distance measures can deal with high dimensional data. You'll remember that we had the curse of dimensionality which means that distances um, don't behave intuitively in high dimensional spaces and we have problems with clustering algorithms for, for that reason. Uh, we might want to incorporate user-defined constraints and ideally we wanted to find clusters that we can interpret and understand and that can often be difficult when we have high dimensional data. One of the most important ideas within clustering is similarity in distance. So if you think back to what we're trying to do, we're trying to find clusters where the distance between data points within, the, within a cluster is small, so high similarity or low distance within a cluster, but high, but low similarity and high distance between clusters. So distance and similarity are really key ideas with clustering. So if we're trying to measure the distance between items, we need some way to measure, um, so to group the items, we need some way to measure the distance between them. So distance and similarity are just inverses of one another, so we really only need to talk about one at a time. Often we're going to represent the, our data points as objects in attribute vectors. So you can see on the left-hand side, we've got an employee database, we've got a whole lot of employees with different attributes. On the right-hand side, we've got term frequencies for documents. So you might want to think about which objects within the employee database are most similar to each other, and which objects within the um, term, which within the document data set are more similar to one another. So when it comes to distance or similarity measures, let's look at distance measures. There's a number of properties that are, that need to be um, used for the function that we can use as a distance. And these are the three that are listed up here. So for all objects A and B, the distance between A and B has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we have to have positive distances, you can't have a negative distance. And the distance between A and B has to be the same as the distance between B and A, otherwise the universe breaks. We, we can't have distances that um, are, are further one way than the other. Uh, for any object A, the distance between itself, A and A, or it, it and itself, has to be zero, otherwise things don't work very well. And the last one is called the triangular inequality, and it say, says that um, the distance between A and C has to be at least less than or equal to the distance between A and B plus B to C. So B is a point somewhere in between them, uh, but maybe not exactly in between them. So it just means that C, a, distance between A and C can't be any more than the distance between A and B and B and C. So there's several common distance measures that are used, uh, and we'll just go through each of those. The first is Manhattan distance. So 
in Manhattan, um, we moved by streets and avenues. You can't move diagonally. So this Manhattan distance is trying to take that idea. So the distance between vector x and vector y is the absolute value of the distance between x1 and y1 plus the absolute value of the distance between x2 and y2 and all up to xn, yn. So it's just um, it's the distance moving along streets and avenues. Uh, next one is uh, the Euclidean distance. This is you you would be really aware of this one. All this is saying is that it's the it's the normal distance as a crow flies, and we we've seen this lots of times. So we just have the difference between each of the x one y ones, square them, and then take the square root of the sum of them. So this is just the normal Euclidean distance that you would have learnt in high school. Another one that we sometimes use is the cosine similarity. Well, the distance there would be 1 minus the cosine similarity between x, y, x and y. And the cosine similarity is defined as um, you take the xi value times the yi value, sum them, and then divide by the square root of the squares of each of those. And it's called the cosine similarity because it's essentially the co it's related to the cosine between the two vectors x and y. So if you draw x and y, you take the cosine of the angle between them. So if the angle between them is zero, so if x and y are the same, then um, the cosine of zero is one, so it just, that means that they're totally similar. And if the if they're totally um, at one eighty degrees, then it will be zero. We need to deal with binary attributes in a, in a particular way. So what I'm showing here is a contingency table for the binary data. So we've got object i and object j, and so object i can take the value 0 or 1, and object j can take the value 0 or 1. So what we've got here is just a, b, c, d. So a is the number of ones that object i has in common, object b, uh, Value b is the number of times that object j has a value 0, but object i has a value 1. Um, c is the number of times that um, object j has a 1, but, but object i has a 0. And d is the number of times that object a, i and j both have the value 1. So, we can, so when it's symmetric, we can have a simple matching coefficient, so the distance between i and j. So i and j can be a vector of, of bits, that's how we can get a and a, b, c, d more than um, 1. So uh, the distance for the simple matching coefficient, you just add b and c. So b and c is the number of times where they're different, so we're doing distance. So um, B and C is the number of number of places where it's different, so it's a distance divided by all of the um, possible bit values. The Jacquard coefficient is similar, except we don't want we don't worry about the cases where they're both zero. So we're really only interested in the the cases where they're ones. And sometimes we need to do that if it's invariant. Let's look at an example. So here we have um, we have three data points: Jack, Mary, and Jim. And we've got gender, which is male and female. We've got um, fever, uh, cough, whether someone has a cough, and then the values of four tests. Gender is a symmetric um, attribute, so we're just going to ignore it for the time being. And the remaining attributes are asymmetric. So let's just look at um, fever, cough, test one, test two, test three, and test four. So um, we only let the values y and p equate to 1 and the value n and 0, uh, n, n is going to be 0. So we can get a distance between Jack and Mary. So the distance between Jack and Mary is b, so b is the number of places where Jack is 1 but Mary is 0. And there's no cases where Jack is 1 and Mary is 0. So that means b is 0, so that's why the 0 comes there. C is the number of places where um, Jack is 0 but Mary is 1. And Jack is Mary, Jack is um, 0 but Mary is 1. 
test three is, is an example of that. So that's the only one. So that's why we have a one there. Then we divide by a plus b plus c. a is just the number of places where they're both one. And you can see um, fever, test one, uh, are the two. Fever and test one are the two places where they're both one. So that's where we get the two. And the b and the c we know already. So if we have one, so zero plus one is one, divided by two plus one is three. So one third gives us 0.33. So that's how we, how we get that. And we can work out a similar thing for Jack and Jim and Jim and Mary. And this is a, um, it gives us a similarity between the, um, or, sorry, distance between the, each of the examples, or dissimilarity. Uh, sometimes we want some attributes to count more than others. And we can do that fairly easily by just adding a weight to um, the distance measure. So the example with the Euclidean measure, Euclidean distance, would be to just put a W1 to a Wn before each of the attributes. And then if we don't want the attribute to count, we set the W to zero. If we want it to count a lot, we can set it more. Um, if we have categorical attributes, then we can use a simple matching. Um, so, so if the distance is one, if they match, otherwise um, uh, zero. Or we can convert the nominal attribute into a binary attribute. So that's called binarization. You know all about that from your assignment. And then we can use a usual distance measure. Uh, and if all the attributes are nominal, we can divide by totaling. Divide, we can normalize it so that it's a bit easier. Often we want to normalize our values. Because if you think about the way that the distance measure works, if we have one attribute that, say, is um, someone's salary and is measured in thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, compared to someone's height, which might be measured in uh, just a few meters, then the distance between their measurements in their salary is going to be much more than their distance in terms of their height, and that means it's going to contribute more to the distance and to the clustering. And usually we don't want that to happen. Usually we want each of the attributes to, to have an equal um, contribution to the distance measure. So to do that, we should normalize our attributes. So we know about normalization from, I think, week three. So here we've, we've just got the min-max normalization that we saw before. So x minus the min of x divided by max, of x, max x minus min x. So there we're normalizing the values from max from min and max x back to 0 and 1. Here's an example. So um, on the left-hand side, we've got some data points. Um, and we, the ones that we're interested in, so gender's not a problem. Uh, we're just converting that to zeros and ones. Age, uh, the lowest age is 27, and the highest age is 52. So we can... Um, Normal, so we can do a min-max normalization, and you can see on the right-hand side, we get our normalization of age. So 27, the lowest value becomes 0, 52, the highest value becomes 1, and the others are spaced inside. And salary is the same. So uh, the minimum salary is 19,000, and the maximum is 100,000. So when we do min-max normalization on our salary, then we get that. But you can use other kinds of normalization as well. You can do the z-score normalization or the um, or the logs and the sigmoid ones that we that we saw in class earlier, and then when we get the distance, we can you can see below how we can get those distances between two and three and three and four. So points ID two and ID four are much further apart than points two and three. Now with these distance measures we can put them into something called a distance matrix, or if there's similarities, a similarity matrix. And um, all we do is, the, is uh, so for example, in, in what we've got here, uh, D21 is the distance between item 2 and item 1. And of course it's a symmetric matrix because we know that distances between 1 and 2 have to be the same as the distances between 2 and 1. The values along the diagonal have to be zero because we know that the distance between a point and itself is zero. So distance matrix uh, matrices are, are often often used in clustering, and we'll see that in nine a little bit later. So here's an example using term similarities in documents. 
So we've got a data set here with five documents and we've got um, some value of essentially a frequency for each of the terms. And using our um, similar, we can create a similarity matrix um, in using the, the similarity function um, as we can see on the bottom right. Often what we want to do is take thresholds of those. So for example, we could threshold, we could take a threshold of 10 and then if any similarities above 10 we we make it a 1 and any similarities less than 10 then we set it to 0 and the, the benefit of doing that is that we can then visualize the data so here's that same similarity mate threshold and similarity matrix and um, we can draw a 1 we so we've got our data points there there's blue dots and if there's a one then we draw a line between those data points and you can see this is a way to visualize our, our data the other idea that's quite important in clustering is this idea of centroids, metoids, and representative points. Centroids is the point at the middle of a cluster. So it may not be an actual point, it's just the middle of the cluster. So in the picture at the bottom, the red dot is the centroid. So you can see all the little green dots. They're, they're the data points, and um, the cent we've got two clusters, and there's the centroid, the middle point of the cluster, is the red dot, but it's not necessarily, or at all in this case, a real data point. Medoid is a similar idea, but it's an actual point in the data set. So I haven't shown them there, but um, the centroid, the medoid would be one of the green dots close to that red dot, the one closest to it. And representative points are points around the cluster that are representative of the cluster, and they, they're needed if we have clusters that aren't round. The idea with the reason we have centroids and metoids is partly they're used for clustering, but once we've found a cluster, then we can use the centroid as a data as a pseudo data point that represents that cluster. So if we want to reduce the number of data points, but then with clustering we can use the centroid. Now, we know about how to find the distance between data points, but we often need to understand the distance between clusters. And there are several approaches for finding this. Um, and the first one is called single link. So single link is just the, so the, the, the distance between two clusters, the single link distance is just the shortest distance between the two clusters. So the, the smallest distance between points in the clusters. And you can see it in the diagram at the bottom. Another way of measuring distance between clusters is complete link, and that's the longest distance between the points, so the, two, the distance between the two furthest away points. A third way to get the distance between clusters is the average link, and all that is is to work, we work out all the, distant, all the possible distances between points, and then we average it, and that gives us the average link. And finally, we can take the distance, uh, the centroid distance. So the centroid, so the centroid is just the average point uh, of the cluster, as we saw before. So the centroid distance is just the distance between the centroids. So there's several different kinds of methodologies for doing clustering. The first one we're going to look at is hierarchical clustering. Hierarchical clustering creates a tree of clusters and subclusters, and that's called a dendrogram. And there's two main approaches to hierarchical clustering, which are analogs of one another. So the first is divisive hierarchical clustering. The idea here is that we start with all of the examples in a single cluster, and then we break that cluster into, into multiple subclusters, and then we break those ones up into multiple subclusters, and we keep on doing that until we get um, every data point in its own cluster. The other way, so it's a top-down approach. The other approach is a is agglomerative clustering, and there it's a bottom-up approach. We, so we start with every data point in its own cluster, and then we merge clusters as we go. And eventually, eventually we end up with all of the all of the, we just have one cluster with all of the data points in it. So that's hierarchical clustering. We'll see how it works in a minute. Um, the other approaches are partitional clustering. So here we start with um, k random centers, and then we decide which examples to put in the clusters, and then we um, adjust that and, and iterate. 
and we'll see an example of that k-means clustering a bit later. Um, some other, other approaches are nearest neighbor clustering and another approach which is often commonly used density based clustering. Here we're trying to cluster data points so that dense, the dense regions of the data space are, are clusters and there's a method called expectation maximization clustering which essentially does that. So first off let's look at hierarchical clustering. So clusters are created in levels um, so we're actually creating sets of clusters at each level. Eventually we need to decide where to cut those so that we can choose the clusters that we're interested in. So as I mentioned before, agglomerative clustering, all of the items are each in their own cluster. We iteratively merge those clusters and until we get them all in one cluster. It's bottom up. And divisive is the other way around. Initially everything's in one cluster and we just divide. So um, here's an example. So the first, one, the first, the top is um, agglomerative clustering. For some reason, hierarchical clustering algorithms always have um, uh, ladies' names. So agglomerative clustering is called Agnes, and it's an acronym, uh, which I can't remember what it is. And then there's divisive clustering. So that's the um, the divisive approach is called Diana. Uh, okay, so. Looking at agglomerative clustering, in step zero, our, six, our five data points are in individual clusters. At step one, we combine A and B, because they're the closest. Uh, at step two, we combine D and E, because they're the next most closest. Then the next, we, we add in C to that cluster. And then we combine A, B, and C, D, E cluster to become A, B, C, D, and we're finished. And divisive is exactly the, the same, but in the opposite direction. So what we end up with is a dendrogram, and that's just a tree structure which illustrates um, how the data points are related. So we have A and B close together, C and D close together, then C, D and E are next close together, then A, B, C, D, E, and then finally with F. So each level, if we cut it at each level, that shows the clusters for that level, and at the root we have one cluster, at the leaf we have the individual clusters. Uh, this is just showing what I've already talked about with the agglomerative clustering, so I don't think we'll look at that. Okay, let's go through an example. So on the top left-hand cor corner, we have our, um, our matrix, our um, similarity matrix. Um, on the bottom, in the middle, at the bottom, we've got our we've got our um, how the clustering will happen, and then on the right-hand side, we've got our data points. So when we have a threshold of 1, we're looking for the 1s in our um, similarity matrix, and you can see A, B, and D, C are the 2. So you can see that at level 1, A, B, and A, B are connected, and C and D are connected, and you can see that in the diagram with the data points. When we move to the next threshold, it's A, C, uh, and B, C, and A, D. And that shows, and we can see that they're linked, and that's uh, our next level. When we go to the next level, um, we've got, we're looking at three, so A and E and B and E and D and E are, are linked. A, E, B, E and D, E. You can see that's where those green lines are. And then we can go to the next level, which is 4. Now we're interested in B and D. Um, but that's not giving us any... We're already in one cluster now. And finally, uh, at similarity of 5, we've got C and E. But again, that we're already, we've already got our one cluster. Uh, with a divisive approach, we can, we can go the other way around. So we start off with one supercluster, and then at each, we work out... Which which way is the is the best place to split? So because we're dealing with um, distances between clusters, we need to think about whether we want um, single link, complete link, or average link for our for use in the hierarchical uh, algorithms. We can do hierarchical clustering in NIME quite easily. So the most straightforward way is to use the hierarchical clustering node, and we can set the number of clusters. Uh, in that node 
all that does is it specifies the level of the dendrogram to write out as clusters in the output. And we can choose either single link, complete link, or average link, and we can we can look at the type of distance function we use as well. And then finally, when after you've um, run it, there's an option to view the dendrogram to see what the tree looks like. So let's move now from hierarchical clustering to partition clustering. So with partition clustering, what we want to do is divide up our data set of n data points into k clusters. So given a particular k, we want to find the partition of k clusters that optimizes some partitioning criterion. Now, I did, in the best of all possible worlds, we could just look at every possible partition and then just work out the criterion for it and then just choose the one that um, has the optimal criterion. But unfortunately, that doesn't work very well because the number of partitions increases much faster um, than the number of data points as we add data points. So it's a, comp it's a computational explosion kind of problem. So we need to use heuristic approaches to do it. And the most famous one is called k-means clustering, which came out in 1967. So each cluster is represented by the center of the cluster. The other approach is called k-metoid clustering. There, instead of having a cluster represented by a centroid, we have it represented by a, a metoid. So first off, let's look at k-means clustering. So it's a really straightforward, simple algorithm. So given a k, what we do is we divide up our data points into k non-empty sub subsets. Next thing we do is compute the seed points as the centroids of the clusters of that current partition. So for each of the current clusters, we calculate a centroid. And you can see how we've done that. Then we assign each object to the cluster with the nearest seed point. Then we go back to step two. So we recalculate the seed points of the data points that are now in that cluster. And what tends to happen is they might have moved a little bit. Then we throw all the data points out and we re-put them into the clusters. And we keep on iterating like that until we no longer change the, the clusters. And it usually... Um, um, converges after very few iterations. So here's an example. On the left hand side, so if we've chosen k equals 2. So we are, uh, so the blue, the, the di little diamond are our data points. So we choose two um, initial centroids, so they're those red dots, and we assign the objects to the cluster that are that are the most similar. And you can see uh, in the middle diagram on the top row, that's what that clustering is done. Then we update the cluster means based on the data points that are in that cluster. So you can see on the top right hand side, for the light blue data points, we find that we, we've found a new um, centroid. And you can see that it's moved quite a lot from the diagram on the left hand side. We do the same thing for the other cluster, and you can see that, that that centroid has moved as well. Then we reassign, um, then, we th then we throw all the data points out again, and then we update the cluster means, and uh, based on, on, based on the, the current centroid, so where those red dots are, and we keep on iterating through that, and what happens is the cluster means slightly change. Here's an example um, just in one dimensional space. So on the first row, given these values and k equals two, we randomly assign means. So sometimes we just calculate a value, but other times you just randomly assign it to one of the data points. So we've assigned mean one to the value two, mean two to the m two to the central two to the value four. So when we assign our points, um, Two and three are closest to mean two to M one to cluster one, and all of the other data points are closer to um, cluster four. So if we recalculate our means, the mean of the or the centroid of the first cluster K one, uh, two plus three divided by two is two point five. 
and the and so that means the two has now become two, the centroid two, the centroid m one, in the at the start which was two now becomes two point five, and we do the same thing for cluster two. So m two which was four now becomes sixteen. Then we reassign the data points. So now two, three, and four are closer to two point five than to sixteen, and all of the rest are closer to sixteen than to two point five. Again, we work out our clusters. So now we've our centroid. So now we've got two, three, and four. So the centroid would be three, and the centroid for the other cluster become it becomes eighteen. So you can see that the centroids are slightly moving. So in the next step, um, we now look at all the data points again and see how close they are to the new centroids 3 and 18. And it turns out that 2, 3, 4 and 10 are closer to centroid 3 and all of the rest are closer to centroid 18. So then we re-evaluate the clusters. So now 2, 3, 4 and 10 in cluster 1, the, me the, the new centroid is now 4.75 and similarly in the other one it becomes 19.6. We re-allocate uh, the data points, so now 2, 3, 4, 10, 11 and 12 are closer to 4.75 than to 19.6 and the rest go to 19.6. We recalculate our clusters, our centroids, so now um, it, the, four, the one that was 4.75 has now become 7 and the one that was 19.6 has become 25. We reassign all of our data points but look what's happened. They've changed. They kept. They've so they've stayed in the same cluster. So because we because we've got the same clustering, we don't need to iterate anymore. And then that's the end of the algorithm. So they would be the two clusters of the data for k equals two. So it's a really straightforward algorithm. Uh, just some comments on k-means. So the strength is that it's relatively efficient. So it's order t, k, n, where n is the number of objects, k is the number of clusters, and t is the number of iterations. But normally, um, k, the number of clusters, and the number of iterations, t, are much, much less than n. So it, it turns out to be relatively efficient. Uh, however, it has several quite bad weaknesses. The first is that it's only um, applicable if you can calculate a mean. So what do you do with categorical data? Second of all, you need to specify k, the number of clusters in advance, and often you don't know that. Although there's ways to um, work out what that k should be. Perhaps the worst problem is it can't handle noisy data and more specifically outliers. So outliers throw the centroid because the centroid is the average of all the data points in the cluster. So if you have a data point that's way away from the um, from the from all the others, it totally draws the um, centroid away and and distorts the clusters. And finally, it only really works for for convex clusters. So it can't find clusters in non-convex shapes. So those curvy clusters that we saw at the start of the lecture tonight, um, k-means can't find those. So there's been uh, several variations to k-means, so um, and they change things like the way that the initial k-means are selected, the dissimilarity calculations, and and strategies to calculate the means. So for example, to be able to handle categorical data, there's a method called k-modes, and it just replaces the means with, them, with modes. So, as I mentioned before, the main problem with k-means is that it's sensitive to outliers. Uh, so, since an object with a really large value can substantially distort the um, data. So, what we need to do instead is to take medoids instead of um, the mean. Because the, the medoid, even with an outlier, won't be the data point that's the outlier. It'll be one that's more central to the cluster and it isn't affected um, quite as much, it isn't affected by the outliers. So you can see in the diagram below, we've chosen the those little green funny shapes, they're the medoids or the most centrally located object. So to do that, we use, we've, they've, the, there's a, a thing called k-medoids clustering or PAM, partitioning around medoids. 
So it's a similar kind of idea to k-means clustering. So it starts from an initial set of metoids, and then it iteratively replaces one of those metoids by one of the other data points if it improves the total quality of the clustering. And we, so we need some measure of clustering. So we could measure the, cust the cluster diameter, for example. To give you a bit of a feeling for how it works, um, here's how it might work. So here we have our data points. We've chosen k equals 2. So we arbitrarily chose um, uh, k o an object as initial metoids. We assign the data points to those metoids, just like we did with k-means, and then there's a cost. So in this case, the total cost is 20. We randomly select a non-metoid object. You can see the little mauve data point at the very bottom. And then we um, calculate the cost of swapping the metoid with that one. If it if it uh, increases the cost, then um, if the quality is improved, then we continue going around. And again, we keep on looping until nothing changes. So both k-means and k-metoid clustering are quite straightforward to do in Nine. k-means is really straightforward. We just use the k-means node. If you read through the help for the node on the right-hand side of the of the workspace, you can see how to how to do it. Essentially, you just have to set the k. Uh, K-metoid is a little bit different, so it needs a distance matrix to be calculated. So you need to calculate that a little bit different. So um, to do that, you have a distance matrix calculate node that you link to your um, to your data. So your data goes into the distance matrix calculate, and you configure it so that it um, has a particular distance function and um, approach and then uh, what comes out of that is your original data plus tacked to the end of it is the distance matrix that symmetric distance matrix then you feed that into the k-metoids and you can do the, the clustering quite nicely so in summary cluster analysis is grouping objects based on their similarity has wide applications it's often used in data exploration we can calculate measures of similarity and distance for different kinds of data. Our clustering algorithms can be categorized into hierarchical methods, partitioning methods, and two that we and some that we didn't look at: model-based methods, density-based methods, and grid-based methods. And um, there's still lots of research issues on cluster analysis. For example, um, clustering with specific constraints. So, uh, thanks for listening, and I'll see you in class. Good night.